My name is Mark Chalmers, and I'm president and CEO of Energy Fuels. Energy Fuels is a unique company. There's no company like Energy Fuels because we cover the uh, large portion of the critical mineral suite, which includes uranium, vanadium, and the rare earth elements. And we're very proud of the fact that we have a very unique position in the United States of America. But you're in the UK now. UK, UK rules. Let, yeah, let, let's talk. talk. Okay, let's talk. In UK. <laughs> our, our assets are mainly in the United States. How's that? Matter? Well, look, uh, you're, you're over here for WNA, the World uh, Nuclear Association Conference. It's downstairs. It's over running over the next few days. Um, your feet are not going to touch the ground, are they? No, they're not. I mean, I don't think I've ever been busier at a WNA meeting uh, because there's a buzz out there on all things nuclear, from uranium mining right on through to nuclear power. Yeah, it, I mean, it's pretty sad. And, and some pretty big names rocking up downstairs. We saw, obviously, and even like Kaz Atom Prom got, got themselves a little side section going on there because I think people are trying to work out what they're doing, who they're doing it with, and what's that mean for the rest of us. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this, hearing back up, um, w w you know, what those conversations are like. But let, let's let's talk about, um, if you don't mind, um, what are you trying to get out of the WNA? What, who are you meeting? What are you talking about? What are you trying to um, get out of it in terms of understanding how you time the market and position the company? Well, I think that particularly this year um, with WNA and the nuclear industry, people are really getting this whole need for full integration and not being dependent on Russia, China, and other our political foes. So I think that the, the lights popped on and uh, people are starting to get a little uh, sweaty about the dynamics that are brewing. Certainly we know that the uh, dependence on Russia uh, after the, with the invasion of Ukraine and the ongoing war, uh, then you see things like a political coup in Niger. Uh, you see Cameco, uh, you know, reducing guidance. Uh, a number of factors are starting to tip in favor of increasing uranium prices, and we're seeing that. And the question is how far do they go and how high do they go? And, and how that all translates into at least the primary mining right on through the nuclear fuel cycle. Right. There's a few things I want to talk about there in terms of, obviously, Russia, Ukraine have been going on, on, on for a while. And I think we talked ad nauseum about some of the, the knock-on effects. Like Niger is the big one. I mean, no one kind of expected or saw that uh, coming. 5% of the market. Is that going to resolve itself? Are we going to get back to any sense of normality? Yeah, I, I'm not an expert in Niger, but... Um, and I've said this to you before, Matt, when I see the price of uranium moving, it's usually because of a number of factors. And Niger is a new factor, as is, um, you know, certainly um, Russia, Ukraine is, is, is not so new now. Um, but these things are all playing on people's minds that, that we have to have these basic capabilities from mining all the way through conversion, enrichment, and fuel fabrication right on through to nuclear power plants. And stay in control. Yeah. Of your own destiny. Okay. And then we'll, we'll come on to some of those things in, in a second. Um, let's just talk um, a little bit about the, we'll stick, let's stick with the uranium first. I think the rare earths is where we've talked a lot about in the last year. It's exciting there. But uh, uranium for you, um, maybe Q2 numbers. Give us give some highlights there because there's a few things which kind of might affect your decision making. Yeah, we have uh, 135 million of working capital. And that's actually quite conservative because it doesn't include the uh, increases in uranium prices in our um, inventories or some of our investments. So it's really north of 200 million. We don't have any debt. Um, you know, we're very proud of our strong balance sheet and we're very uh, proud of the, the great advances we're making in both uranium and rare earths. Right. So what's the importance of getting the balance sheet bit right? Well, I've worked with companies that didn't and, and it wasn't a very comfortable position to be in. I think we're in um, an enviable position in the fact that we have uh, this ability to, to fund our uh, current activities with, with, without dilution. And at the same time, we're in an excellent position. If we do, do decide to do some M&A, uh, we're, we're in a good position to do that. Right. And, and, and let's talk about some of these positioning things. Like we, again, over the past couple of years, we've talked about some of the moments where you've Made announcements to the market about things that you're doing, which I'm not sure the market entirely understood. And you've seen a few, a few highs and a few lows um, there. Talk to me about positioning. You, you talk, okay, get the balance sheet right. That's important. It gives you optionality in terms of how yeah. you do things. You're running a 
Well, I was going to say dual track, but it's it's it's, it's, it's I think you've got more than uh, two tracks going on here because you've got the you've got the vanadium bit and, and, and other sort of revenue lines. But let's stick with uranium and um, the rare earth component. What are the fundamental things? The fundamental positioning of of certain variables that you have done that you think people should have recognised. And what are the things coming up that you're going to try to do or try and take advantage of in the market as you see it? Well, on the uranium front, I mean, we're we're actively developing um, some of our conventional uranium projects. So we've got a number of people underground at Pinion Plain, um, at the Whirlwind Project, and at the LaSalle Complex. We um, And we're, we've been pushing that forward. I mean, securing long-term contracts for up to eight years, uh, certainly was very important. Uh, you know, and I think the other thing is that we've kept our key people. We've kept our key people that have the experience. And right now, there's such a shortage of experience. I mean, one of the reasons Cameco uh, downgraded their, their guidance was a you know, lack of people, right? And so that's never been more acute. So I think that when you look at our company and you look at the core group we have, we have about 150 people with basically all the skill sets and just about every facet of what we do. And that's enviable in itself. Okay. So pe- 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 people, I think, again, we, 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 we've stated that because there's been such a long down cycle here, we've seen people leave, retire, move into other areas. Um, with regards to what you're doing at White Mesa, because I see White Mesa is kind of key to what you're doing. One is the kind of critical minerals hub uh, for sure, but also conversations with uranium companies to process their ore stock again something we've talked about but i imagine it's got a little bit more frantic recently with price moving up and possibly even as you'll we'll talk about in a second some of the rare earth companies with prices going down yeah there's there's all these interesting dynamics i mean we're trying to get the max value out of that facility and um and again i i, th- I think it's 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 a remarkable opportunity that um, again, I think people are envious of having a facility that can do so much. So yeah, on the on the uranium front, uh, when it comes to looking at um, uh, toll milling agreements or or uh, purchasing agreements, we only have one uh, toll milling agreement, and that's with with Consolidated Uranium. Um, and we we have considered um, a buying schedule, but the prices weren't high enough yet to to put out a buying schedule. Well. They're starting to get there. We're starting to get there. What are we going to do? Well, we, we haven't really made that full step yet. But again, it's going to go back to maximizing the value of that asset because he who has a mill controls the district. It's not the miners. It's, it's, the, it's the mill that controls right. the and district. Let, let's go back to that 50-50 conversation or DSO solution for those providers, which affects their economics greatly, which then affects the ability to raise capital cheaply greatly. The knock-on and ripple effect is vast for sure, right? Yeah. Well, when we look at if we, we do put a purchasing schedule in place, I mean, we, we own the uranium. We market the uranium. They don't market the uranium. We own it. So, um, it, it, yeah, it, it doesn't um, doesn't make sense to have another uranium mill because that mill has never been fully utilized. But now, with what we're doing on the uranium front and the rare earth fronts, we're going to uh, maximize utilization out of the facility. And again, it just bodes well for the future on all things critical. Elements. Okay, and I gave, gave people a clue as to how you take advantage of that optionality with regards to how you utilize the mill. Uranium price is on the up. Rare earths on the down. It's, a, it's always, been a, always been erratic, but... Therein lies the opportunity for companies like yourself. I mean, are, are you when what what are those types of conversations now versus the types of conversations you would have had when we were back down in Barcelona? Yeah, well, I, I think that um, because we're diversified, we can capture the ups and the downs differently than others can. And right now, with the ups of the uranium prices, uh, that's putting us in a very strong position. Meanwhile, the rare earth um, looking to the future, the demand looks phenomenal for rare earths, but the prices have come down. The prices are like half of where they were a year or two ago. So that is kind of messing up the model with a lot of the other rare earth companies on um, what their financials look like, uh, what their ability to finance looks like. Um, You know, you've seen it with, um, um, you know, the earnings from places like Linus and MP. It's really uh, hitting hard to a lot of groups. So 
So again, with the diversification we have, it gives us completely different avenues for how we capitalize on that that others don't have. And so, um, you know, I've said this publicly before, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, other sources of monazite uh, that could include M&A, like we purchased the Bahia project. Now I'm switching over to the rare earth side of things. And, um, and we're still continuing that at full speed. I mean, uh, I've been traveling around the world looking at opportunities. And again, I hope that we're going to be in a stronger position now, particularly with the way that the market's cycling with the reduction of the rare earth prices and the increase of the uranium prices. It's, it's kind of interesting. It's, and, and it's a kind of, it's a kind of the way a, a, like a, a, a business consultant would look at this. Like, there's lots of great, exciting rare earth stories out there. People are you know, getting real buzz on because the future looks bright for rare earths. But when you're starting from ground, Zero, you know, starting from scratch, I should say, it's difficult because you haven't got those sunk costs of plants and mills and people and all of that history. Um, you're starting from scratch. You got to finance that. You got to find the people to actually work out how to do it technically, deliver it technically. You got to build it. You got to get cheaper capital, and you're spending money on stuff which you don't have to. So, partnerships. Yeah, we're, we're looking, we're exploring all different types of opportunities right. to get feed to the White Mesa Mill for the rare earth business. And I think that's where the realities have, have, have come to roost for a lot of these uh, people in the rare earth business was very fragmented, uh, is that they cannot finance those projects. They do not have the expertise. And the backstop of sending material to China, and, and I, I always say this, we should be thankful for China advancing the rare earth sector because we wouldn't have permanent magnet motors um, at, at the level we do without China. So, but right now, um, the, the, the world is needing uh, other sources and diversification from China, um, and, and we're a logical outlet here. And, and we don't need the capital that they need. We, we, we already have the expertise. And most importantly, we're in the United States of America. Well, well, absolutely, because we're seeing the U.S. government starting to actually dish out some money on the uranium side, like they said they would two, two or so years ago. It's finally happening to a few few companies, beneficiaries of that. And the IRS still is obviously doling out cash to in, industry, et cetera. So I think that there's a kind of weight behind the the energy transition now. Nuclear's role in that in the, in the U.S., is that now cemented? Is that I've got the backing of the Senate, the House, and you're going to get the money and access to money that you want? Well, I wouldn't say it's it's guaranteed, but um, I think that you know you're really seeing a shift in bipartisan support for all of the above. Right now, we got to be careful that we don't get uh, overly um, held back by uh, a number of the movements. Um, that are going on, and, and certainly the focus on ESG is, is front and center, uh, but there's also a lot of people that still don't like mining, and they think that we can be independent of Russia, China, and these other countries uh, without mining in the United States. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword in some aspects. So, so but there definitely is momentum uh, on every front. Um, you know, our company either can now or will be able to produce up to 10 of the critical elements of 50, and most that you talk to can produce one or two elements at the most. Um, so that is, again, a big d differentiator. So, how, okay, the government may or may not help because uh, they work at different speeds. Industry, leaning in, must be keen to understand what you're going to be able to output. You will need to be able to alert some market, some of those contracts, or maybe some M&A, or some way of getting that feed into White Mesa, U.S. is going to be really, really important to you. It's a big market. Um, how, how do you put? How do you piece all of all of that together? What can we expect time-wise? And what are you going to get on with anyway? Because it's going to build it, and they shall come a little bit, isn't yeah. it? Well, on the uranium front, again, as the price of uranium goes up, we'll we'll start um, restarting more of our operations. Uh, we'll sign more long-term contracts, and uh, so that all bodes well uh, on the uranium front. Um, um, is We're, that quite simple? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Is that kind of, you kind of feel like, I've been there, done that, we've we've got what we've got. That is a simply a factor of price 
movement and the contracts will come. We know what we're doing there. Whereas rare earth is a bit more touchy feel. Yeah, the, the rare earth front, it's it's focusing on salt, uh, securing the, the, the molecules. And for the reasons I gave you, a lot of people that were thinking that they could fall back on China to sell their molecules are now realizing that doesn't look like it's going to be a very good plan for them. And so we're still very actively, we've never been more active on securing molecules for the front end of the White Mesa Mill, and we're canvassing the entire world. And we've got some exciting things that I think could come to fruition in the not too distant future, but that's what the market wants to see on the rare earth front. They want to see that we have the molecules, that we've completed the phase one separation facility that is well advanced right now at the mill, and that we're going to get the scale that, that you know, basically justifies a re-rate in the rare earth industry. Right. And I know people are excited about it because you've got, you've got a site visit planned at the beginning of October, a lot, well, and, and before then. Lots of people are, are running up to the White Mesa Mill at the moment. We're, we're getting, we've never had so many people showing up at the White Mesa Mill. We have an open house on October 10th and 11th. And we're inviting people far and wide. And uh, we had, the last one we had was two years ago. And uh, we're really excited to show people all the, the great things that are happening at the White Mesa Mill. It's interesting. Okay, and we better go full, full circle back back here in London. Um, to that. I know you're bouncing around. Yeah, so you barely got time to actually attend the conference because you got so many people wanting to see you. It, you know, we spoke before um, we started filming. And um, what what is the message to all of those people in all of those conversations that that you're having? Because some of it's going to be about. Well, you tell me what are the different types of conversations? Well, I I, I think the, the the main conversations I'm having is on this whole energy transition front. And and it's really if if you believe that we have to transition, then Energy Fuels is a great company to to be invested in for that transition. So. I think that um, people are waking up um, to the realities on the uranium front uh, for all the right reasons, not the wrong reasons, the right reasons for a change. And they also believe that they, we need these other elements uh, to, to assist with electrification. So that, that's really it. it it's, it's pretty simple, but people are waking up. And they, a lot of them have been sleeping for a long time. And they're waking up and they're saying, we have to do this. We have to invest in these, um, these new elements that take us forward, not backwards. So, um, you know, I think that's the exciting part of it. And, um, and, and it's all pretty predictable. You know, history does repeat itself. And um, when I look at, um, particularly back in that 2005-06 period, it, it feels similar. It's different, but it's similar. And, and I think that that's on the uranium front, that's, that's what people are waking up to. And uh, on the rare earth front, when I drive around town, I just see nothing but electric cars. And I see nothing but electric cars on the commercials and on TV and on billboards and all that. Well, those elements have got to come somewhere. They've got to come somewhere and they've got to be charged with good, clean, cheap energy. So yeah. that, that's the good news. I, th I think the fascinating thing for me coming on this journey with you was to see someone put the building blocks in place not overnight it doesn't happen overnight but to see the sequence that you needed uh to achieve because people are waking up but in the meantime you know a lot of people have been sort of treading water and trying making promises they can't keep you've continued to build balance sheet is there what makes it is there it's it's the kind of golden goose quite frankly in all of this um and you, you live up to your name energy Fuels. fuels. Well, and, and we've continued to spend money on our assets. A lot of people just sat there and did nothing. We haven't. You know, we're, we're doers. And, and the, the team we have, um, they make me look good, Matt, because I kind of point them in the direction. And they, they, just, they just are so energized and so committed to getting us across the finish line on all the fronts that we're working on. Uh, it's 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 staggering. Well, I, I'm looking forward to hearing all of, uh, all about the meetings you're having this later this week, whether today and tomorrow and the rest of this week. Uh, maybe when I see you face to face up at the Mesa Mill. All right, Matt. Always a pleasure. pleasure. Good to see you.